And we're live. Hey guys, welcome back to Seller Sessions Daily, 4 p.m. UK time. Different times around the world, of course. Uh, today, back with me again is Kian Gilzari. This time, we are going to be talking about product development from scratch to launch. Um, so, Kian, do you want to give the audience a little bit of background on yourself? Sure, yeah. Hey guys, how you doing? My name is Kian Gilzari, a uh, friend of the show. I feel like I've been here. Uh, quite a lot in the last few days but um this is the you know the situation we're in we're just trying to um help out as much as possible so yeah basically uh, i've been living and working in china for the past 10 years in that time i've developed over two and a half thousand products uh visited over 500 different factories got an office in china um and through that time i've basically manufactured products under license for the nba olympics for retailers in the us europe uh, as well as the uk and then also for Amazon private label sellers as well. And then I do have a free Facebook group as well called Sourcing with Kian, where I answer any sort of sourcing uh, questions. So that's me in a nutshell. Cool. I uh, just want to quick say hi to people that are joining us. Robert's here. Alan is here. Uh, Dan Venton again joined. Sharon, hello, Sharon. I owe you a call. Uh, Tiffany's back. Good morning, Tiff. How are you doing? Hope you're well. Okay, so why don't we just get it underway, basically? You kick sure. off thing? Sure. So it's actually an interesting topic, right? Because I've sort of been developing products for about 10 years, way before, you know, this whole Amazon bubble took off. And I basically was always developing products for like what we wanted for our brand and what ways we could add more value to the customer and what retailers wanted. But then, you know, when like Amazon sort of kicked off, then, you know, a lot of it comes down to like, you know, keyword research and things like that. And people start to develop pro products based on where there's like volume of traffic rather than what they actually want to make. So I'm going to kind of talk about both here. I'm going to talk about how how we develop products as like brand owners and how to deliver for our audience, and as well a little bit understand the the climate that we're in and how we sort of develop products for what's going on in terms of like where the volume is. So I'll start off with. And by the way, guys, anyone who's like listening live, if you've got any questions, just feel free to write it in the chat box, and I can basically elaborate further uh, on anything that I bring up. But first of all, it's like what I call like self-actualizing. You have to create the product that you actually want because initially a product is made out of a need of something that doesn't exist that you want. So you're essentially trying to make something that is not there. Now you're trying to solve a problem. And I always feel like the best products are the ones that actually solve a problem like um, provide a solution that doesn't exist in the marketplace so first if you're really trying to develop something of value just think about what problem you can actually solve what problems you have in your own household and what you can solve for then after that i would say start with passion is this something that you actually use yourself because the best products that i've ever developed are the ones that i do use myself and after i've developed it and i've got the sample and before i've brought it to market well i'm like when i was involved in the camping and outdoor brand any sort of tent backpack sleeping bag I was hiking in it, I was climbing in it, I was sleeping in the sleeping bag and I was testing it myself. So I know, okay, is it big enough? Does a water bottle pouch actually fit a water bottle? Because honestly, I was actually looking at a bag on Amazon yesterday and one of the negative reviews was the water bottle pouch does not fit the standard size water bottle. And that is just, there's no excuse. You know, you there have to be, yeah, yeah. You, you absolutely have to test these sort of things. Whereas I see a lot of sellers buy from one website, Alibaba, and sell on another website, Amazon, and they don't even actually come into contact with the product themselves. But that's so, so important to use and test your product yourself, just for your own peace of mind as well, that you're bringing something to market of value and that you're happy with. And then after that, I start to look at, okay, do you have something unique? What is your USP, like your unique, unique selling proposition uh, over the leader? Because a lot of people are like, okay, I can bring this to market and I'll just make it a different color or I'll make it a little bit cheaper. Whereas like that can only last so long. That might get you a piece of the pie, but it's only a matter of time before everyone else comes in. So you really have to say like, what is it about my product that is better than everyone else? And then you go from there. And then, okay, if you just have a bunch of, if you don't really know where to start, right? What I like to do is create a mood board. And a mood board is essentially something that I have, like I get a blank wall and wall to wall, I basically, pin on that wall any idea that I have, either related to that product, related to that industry, related to that customer. So I get things like, okay, what are the in colors for 2020? And what are other brands doing for 2021, like the fashion brands? And then how are people packaging the products? Any idea, I print it out, I put it on the wall. I'm like, all right, what are major influencers prom promoting this type of category of product? Put that on the wall. And it, it's almost like um, visual, visualization, kind of like uh, meditation. That you now just see all these different pictures on the wall. And now you try to figure out, right, how do we correlate these together? And you start to like visually just start to piece things in your mind that we're not present before just by having like a mood board. 
And then another thing you can do is essentially buy competitor samples. Now, this sounds really basic, just purchase their, uh, samples and test them. But really what you want to be doing is see what you like about them and what you don't like about them. Because essentially, you could take one positive from like five different competitor samples and just ba basically group them into one. Can and I then make a suggestion here? I'd even go as far as saying buy those before you even get your own samples. Mm -hmm. sure. Buy the competitor samples because... You need like when you when you you know this yourself, right? When you'll get your samples, if you look at your samples in isolation without anything else, they're as good as they're gonna be in isolation. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. before you've ordered, if you've ordered your competitor samples and you specified certain specifications to your factory, by the time you get your samples, you've set the bar already. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so that's a good point. And I actually like to do it both ways because yep. sometimes I like to look at the industry as a whole. But also sometimes when I like to develop something, I think I don't want to get influenced by what anyone else is doing. I want to put everything I want in it first. And then I'll look at competitors to see if I've missed anything. So you Good can point. kind of do it both ways, depending on uh, how knowledgeable you are about that particular product. And then um, th this is an obvious one, but it, you know, reading all the negative reviews on Amazon of your competitors to see where they've gone wrong, but also reading the positive reviews as well, because um, one thing I noticed, like we were doing sleeping bags, right? And you know, sleeping bags are for the outdoors or for sleeping in tents or gardens or whatever. And then like something I saw a lot in positive reviews was, oh, this sleeping bag is perfect for my kids' sleepovers. And it kept coming up. And I was like, well, kids' sleepovers is now like a new keyword that I can put in the back end. And it's not even something that I knew people were using it for. Oh, okay. And if it's a kid's sleepover who's using it, what else do kids um, do on a sleepover? Well, they need somewhere to store their mobile phone. So we create like a little pouch in a sleeping bag to store your mobile phone. So, you, you know, I mean, just the little things like that, you get even more ideas when you figure out what's the use of the product that you find out from uh, competitors' positive reviews. And then what I also like to do is visit the retail store, um, essentially, which sells those products as well, because yes, you can buy them online, but when you see them in a retail store, you often forget how knowledgeable the staff are in retail stores about the product and what other people are buying and what they like about those products. And you can just like pick someone's brain in a store for half an hour and say like, you know, I'm thinking about buying a, you know, this certain type of product. What do people like about this and what do they don't like about it? And they just go off on one and they explain and they're very, very helpful. And the other cool thing about checking products out in the retail stores is being able to see everyone's packaging because quite often in a retail store, the packaging is a lot better than something that you would get online because online they're basically optimizing for shipping and stuff like that. But in the retail store, you, they actually go like over and beyond and you maybe start to get even more ideas based on how you see um, how it's packaged. And then as we sort of just mentioned there, it's like you kind of want to check the search volume traffic uh, of the keywords for the things that you're developing for. Because what I've found sometimes is sometimes I feel like, okay, I've got the best product in the world at the best price, but this is just not something people are searching for on Amazon. Now, if you have um, like your own Shopify website and you have exterior tra um, external traffic, then you're fine. But if you're only relying on Amazon, well, then whatever it is you're developing, you have to make sure the traffic is there. Like I'll give you a good example. We, we were the number one bestseller on NBA.com in the homeware category for the pillows. And we put the NBA player's face on the front of the pillow and their name and number on the back. And then my business partner was saying, oh, let's sell them on Amazon and we'll make a lot of money. But no one is searching on Amazon for like, LeBron James pillow or LeBron James face pillow. And it's like, because the search volume traffic is not there, then it's not going to be so successful on that particular website. So um, Shopify is a great way to do it. I see we have a question coming in about Shopify. Yeah, I was going to say, I've got some few questions. If I run down the board with you, is that all right? And then we'd go sure. back on plan. So just quickly say, uh, Robert Con Connor said, hi, guys. Good morning. Tiffany again. Good morning, guys. Alan's here as well. He said, hey, guys. Dan Venton is also here. Uh, Selvis here as well. Andrew uh, Bryson is here. Dan O'Donnell, where are we? Let's go. So he's saying it's so uh, fresh, refreshing to hear that. I think he was talking about the samples uh, earlier on in the conversation. Um, and then we've got here, Tiffany says, sounds very much like a vision board because you were talking That's about true. explaining how laying out uh, the product and what yeah. to do here. Uh, now we're moving into the uh, the questions. What's the best way to communicate your requirements to suppliers who are unable to travel and non-English speaking? Um, so I think the most basic thing is the RFQ form, which is your uh, request for quotation. But yep. I kind of take it a step further than that, and I always use a specification sheet, which was going to be a, my, my next point, actually, as well is it's like and i think we talked about the specification sheet on previous shows but i'll mention it again uh, briefly it's like oh actually yeah so 
when we talked about it before, Danny, you'd mentioned the billing materials. Yeah, so yeah. The, the specification sheet is basically everything, every single detail about that product is in that sheet. Uh, what's the height, what's the dimensions, what's the Pantone colors of it, um, the, what materials are going into it, and basically even any pictures you have of it, any competitors' fabrics you have, they all go in that specification sheet so that you can give that specification sheet to a supplier and to multiple suppliers, and they mm -hmm. can all quote exactly on the same thing. And the more detail you go into, the more accurate your quote is. I think when we've talked about it before, I gave the example of an outdoor furniture chair. And you know, if you just use an image, well, they don't know if it's steel tubing or aluminum tubing. They don't know what's the thickness of the tubing. So as soon as the more detail you give, the more accurate you can get a price quotation. And it's also that the more detail that you give, you're now telling the supplier that you're very experienced in this product and they respect you more because they know you know the details of this product. And then they're more way more likely to want to do business with you and then also give you a more accurate price as well. So RFQ form and a specification sheet, and some people call them a tech pack as well. Cool. So that, but then he said, how do you do that for non-English speaking as well? So you've explained the best way, like the requirements. How mm -hmm. do you get across for non-English other than ever someone who speaks native tongue, I suppose? And this is where production companies and stuff, these middlemen come into play as well. Yeah, well, another thing you can do is before you've even created your specification sheet, you can find a product that the supplier makes themselves already and mm -hmm. ask them to uh, to send their specification sheet. So let's continue with the example of a furniture chair. You might see one on Alibaba and something or something and say, hey, can you send me the specification sheet of this particular item? And then when you open it, you can just change it to what you want. Maybe you can, uh, when they list the dimensions, change the dimensions. If they have nylon material, change it to polyester. And then they've pretty much done the work for you. But in terms of like non-English speaking, like you'll just have to do use some sort of like translation. I mean, if you mean the suppliers, they, they're happy to see it in English. So as long as you can speak English and the suppliers will fully really accept it in English, it's not the sort of thing you need to translate into Chinese. Yeah. Uh, Dan says, great tip taking on to talking to the sales folk at the store that you mentioned earlier on, you know, when you're going in and visiting and looking at the packaging, whereas you yeah. mentioned in, is when you sell online, it's optimized for selling online rather than in the store, it's optimized for selling visually. Uh, Michael, yeah. what is the best way to do QC during these times since we can't visit? Nothing changes. QC yeah. is done by your third party uh, companies anyway. There are plenty of those guys out there. They're still active. Uh, it's improved a lot in China, right? So yeah. factories are open, 95% production level. So on the, you visiting factories may be different because you can't get out of the UK or wherever you are, Michael. But um, mm -hmm. everything's fine. It's business as usual in China at the moment, is my understanding. Yeah, absolutely. Um, pronunciation, sorry if I butcher your name, Elchin, I think it is. Hey, guys, Ken, could you please share an RFQ specification sheet sample file? Do you have one at all? Yeah, so I've got some on some products. So what I'll do is I'll basically I'll post one in my group uh, sourcing yeah. with Kian, and Good then uh, I'll just basically take out the details, or I'll leave the details in depending on whatever the the product is, just so you can see uh, yeah. an example there. Okay, uh, right, Dan O'Donnell. Not sure. I only see my comments, and the only comments from Seller Session Live. Also, I only see one live at the top of the screen. Is there a way I can see all the comments and the viewers, or is this admin only, Danny? Yeah. So what I understand, guys, like I've only been using this system a short period of time. Um, I don't see comments in certain groups. I only see shared to my pages and on my personal page where, where people view, I can't comment from there. So sometimes when I post a comment, it might appear three times and some you guys might not see that in the feed. So uh, apologies for that, Dan. Uh, Fernando, hello, Danny and thanks for this. Nice to meet you, Kian. One question, do you source mainly from China? Have you other sourcing places? I have one product now that I source from China. The rest is in the UK, but Kian will take up the lead here because this China is where most people source from. Yeah, I mean, I think about 85% of my sourcing is done from China. I also buy some from Vietnam, some from India, um, some from the UK as well, also some from Europe, some from Italy, some from Ireland. So. Uh, some from Greece as well, actually. Uh, so mainly China, uh, but some products you can only get in certain regions uh, as well. And it, it is important to have a little bit of diversification because, like, you know, when the tariffs hit, uh, mm. that impacted just China. But then it's good to have options from different countries as well. But the majority has come from China. Yeah, Tony Sagar, sorry, I missed out. Tony as well says, do you also have your own Shopify store? 
I do, yeah. But it, it to, totally relates to the brand. So we've got one called ActiveDreamers.com, and that's for a sport licensing brand where we sell uh, NBA, NFL, soccer products like this, where we did all the Neymar products. Uh, and then I did build my own Shopify store for Veltro, but it's not mm. available yet. That's on pause because of our current travel ban situation. <laughs> Tony, just to let you know, we're going to do a big one on uh, Shopify Thursday. I'm going to probably do this in a two or three parter because there's about 10 or 12 people that want to come on. So we're going to go in depth. I just need to break out the subjects, even down to information architecture on the website, how that works, SEO. We're going to try and get it so that it's specified in certain areas like we're going to do cat customer acquisition costs we're going to look at long-term value of the customer cohorts all those kind of things so we'll probably do it over a period of time so it'd be quite technical along with the branding side but I just got to put a crew of people together for thursday kian do you want to get back into the flow again sorry we yeah sure no worries and then i would say that you you want to write down every single feature that you want to mm. solve for in your product because you might think this is not possible, but like just write down what you want to solve. Like I'll, I'll give an example, like the travel bag, which I was launching. Uh, one thing I really like to do when I'm traveling is watching movies. And I'm like, well, there's not really a way within my bag that I can watch movies. So what I did was I developed a mobile phone kickstand, which comes out of a zipper puller. You, you basically slip it out and it goes into a kickstand and then you can basically put your mobile phone on it. And then you can put that on the tray table in the plane or the train and you can watch movies. Now, that is not a feature that is available that you can just source from a factory. That's just an idea that I had and then I solved for that. And I, I designed that. I worked with like um, with a different company to basically create the mold for that. But then I also asked the factory for their opinion, their expertise. And just remember, like your factory is also very knowledgeable of these products as well. And they might have certain ideas. So just figure out every single problem problem you want to solve for because remember the first thing was like what problem are you solving figure out write down the list of all those things and then solve for it either yourself or talking to your manufacturer um as well then um it was a specification sheet which we mentioned and then it was don't overdevelop because i've been guilty of this as well like you know we fall in love with these products that we're developing they become our babies and um, sometimes you can spend over a year developing a product and then by the time you've spent all that time on it well someone else has already brought something to market which is not as good but it's just it does the job and now they've basically dominated that certain category so essentially don't take too long to develop something it is important to get it right but just don't go crazy about it um and then next was just like test, test, test. You really absolutely want to test the product. And we kind of mentioned that at the beginning, but it's not only testing it yourself, but once you have the sample and before you want to put it into production, test it with like the third party companies as well, which are going to test it for like, okay, if it's an outdoor backpack, you want to test for like the waterproofness uh, that the buckles don't break, that the zippers are fine. So you want to test it. You want to get a third party to actually test for the uh, legal and industry standards. And then quite often, another thing I'll do, take it to another level is get an influencer to test it as well. So you also have like market validation. So like I would send it to an influencer and say, hey, I'm just I'm thinking about developing this product. This is where I've got to so far. I would love your opinion on it. And why I choose an influencer is that one, they have like um, attention, right? So if they like the product and they want to post about it at a later date, one, they feel involved in the development process of it. Well, they say, well, I got the sample before anyone else got it. So they really value my opinion. Or when I made this suggestion and they actually made that improvement on their product. So now when they promote it, they're like, hey, I was involved in this product and it works for you and it works for them. So uh, test it yourself, get a third party to test it and also get an influencer involved as well. Um, and then once you have that, right, this is really, really important that not a lot of people consider is that you have to align with the right manufacturer that fits your purpose because there's so many different types of manufacturers. And a lot of people think, oh, I just need a supplier in China. Well, actually, there's suppliers who have only got maybe 50 workers in their factory and there's suppliers which have got 2000 workers in their factory and they're both completely different. The one with 2000 workers might get it done at a much better price. They might de deliver it a lot faster for you, but you operate within their rules. But then the one with only 50 workers in the factory might do you like a, a much smaller moq if you're just testing it or they might be willing to offer you a lot more different um coloring options or they might be a lot more open to giving you information about what they're doing for other customers so just consider where you are are you a big brand and you just want volume and price or are you just getting started and you want to align with someone who's going to help you grow and you're going to grow with that factory as well that's really important and then um as we sort of finish up i would say that like marketing always starts with the product development in my opinion because like so many times when you see an ad for a product right 
and they catch you either through like uh, education or entertainment. That's the two ways that you catch uh, catch you scrolling on an ad. Whereas I like to say, hey, marketing actually starts with why your product is better than anything else out on the market. And that's why people really buy the product, not because you've just entertained them or you made them laugh or you taught them something. It's that no, you're actually showing why your product is better. And through that process, you can actually make your product better and then use that as the lead for your advertising. And then the final thing I would say is that like for those of us who do go to China, is to make one item yourself and really understand how your products are made. And that's really how you make the best products because, um, again, let's use the example of the backpack, right? Before I ever went to a factory, I just saw a backpack uh, on the shelf as one unit. But then when I went into the factory, I saw it in diff 30 different pieces. I saw the shoulder straps, the foam that, go that goes in shoulder straps, the webbing, the zippers, the buckles, the pullers, the, the coating, how they cut it, how they stitch it, um, how they maneuver the machines. And it's just like, now I can see that backpack in 30 different processes in my head. And if I'm thinking, hey, I've got this $10 item and I need to get it to an $8 item, well, I can make those calculations in my head based on what I've seen on the production line of how to bring the cost down. Same way if I want to improve the quality and, and bring the cost up, I know where it can be improved. And once you see that process, your mind starts to think in 3D. And then when it comes to making your next iteration of product, you know their entire process start to finish. And then you've also improved your education. So when you're going to talk to more suppliers, you can also explain you know that you know how these products are made and you gain their respect so but there's no point going to a factory for the first time if you've never made anything before you really want to get a little bit of experience under your belt first and then really go over there to broaden your knowledge and broaden your horizons mm -hmm. but that was pretty much it um and that's kind of like 15 steps and um you can obviously go into a lot more detail in each of those steps but that's kind of like a broad overview of how i like to develop products Sounds good. Uh, Fernando, just to let you know, tomorrow we're going to do, I've got two legal eagles coming in to talk about patents and how that affects your products and the legalities around that. So tune in tomorrow and we'll go into more depth. Again, because obviously you're like a machine that pours out all this data. We're like 20 minutes in, right? Uh, yeah. Unless anyone's got any questions, can we use your bag as a uh, case study? Like you've been spending a while to get to where you want with the bag. You don't have to answer mm -hmm. these questions. I just yeah. wonder what, what, where you, where you start your inspiration come from and your conceptualization. Cause you've walked through the steps of uh, putting, you know, these are the regimented steps that you take to put it together. But can you, from a vibe and organic point of view, where mm -hmm. hit you like, Oh, I'm going to do a bag. And why did your bag stand out over others, et cetera? So it's interesting because um, that's a great question. I mean, like I do a lot of traveling, like a lot of um, other entrepreneurs and e-commerce sellers. Mm -hmm. And I was, I never had a bag that I was quite happy with. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, you know, travel bags that either they look really cool, but they don't have the right features or they have all the right features, but they don't look so smart. They're very much box shaped. And because I do so much work with factories and particularly in bags, it was more in like the outdoor and the military bags. I was like, let me just make a travel bag, something that I want for myself. And I just made one and uh, I didn't even put a logo on it. And I just sort of designed it based on what I wanted. And I, I never even wanted to get into the travel space. I just made it for myself. And as I had it and as I was traveling and I was seeing friends and stuff like that, everyone's like, oh, that's a crazy bag. Where'd you get that? I was like, oh, I made it myself. And I go, where can I buy one? I was like, well, I don't sell them. I just made one for myself. And after I heard that maybe four or five times, I was like, actually, I think I've got something here. But I, at that time, this was about two years ago, we were very much in the B2B space. We were just selling to other retailers and we weren't even really selling that much online uh, for our own brand. So I was like, you know what? Um, and, and I listened to someone give a talk about how much money they raised on Kickstarter. And I was like, well, this is all kind of perfect timing because I've got a new product. I want to start a new brand and I want to sell it online. And I've never done Kickstarter before. And that seems to be like where you can actually generate a lot of revenue for your product without even going into production. So I was like, all the stars kind of aligned at the right time. And then I basically um, perfected the bag, went through six or seven different samples, aligned with the right manufacturer. And then I started really going on the going hard on the marketing and getting it out to influencers and creating content all around the world, uh, building the sales page, building the Kickstarter page. So to back page. up a little bit, you got you done a Kickstarter and that basically ra raised the funds for the R&D of the product. Is that what? Well, well, the thing is, uh, my plan was to launch the Kickstarter in April. But essentially, um, the, the the money from the Kickstarter goes into funding your production on the bag. But yeah. I'd basically just gone ahead and made all the samples. And I spent a lot of money on like the, the R&D and the samples and the marketing mm -hmm. and the influencers and stuff like that. But it was all about to pay off like once you launch. Uh, but I was actually very lucky, you know, because like uh, Corona hit at right the time before I was about to launch. Had I launched, it would have been a completely different story. But at least mm -hmm. now I've still not revealed all the features of the bag and I've still not revealed the marketing content that I've built. But as soon as... Um, 
we get out of this corona situation and travel goes back to normal as we know it, I'll be able to launch with full momentum because I know a lot of travel brands have been hit now in that, you know, they can't sell their stock and they do have employees who need to pay and they can't basically pay for their storage costs and they're reducing their ad spend. So I can basically go with full momentum as soon as we're, we're back on our feet again. Yeah, what are you what are you realistically anticipating? I know it's a wait and see thing, but are you looking are you going to push it back to next year? Or do you still think there's a good possibility for this year? Uh, well, it's, so it's a really good question. You know, with like crowdfunding, uh, December, um, November, and December and January are really bad months for crowdfunding, just gotcha. because it normally takes about three months for you to get your product after you order it because you have to give time for it to be manufactured. Mm. But in November and December, everyone's really just shopping for Christmas presents. And then January, is, at which they want delivered next day, obviously. And mm. then um, January is dead because everyone's kind of broke after the whole Christmas period. Mm. So if we can get back to normal by like August, September, then I'll launch then. But if we yeah. get to October, then I was like, there's no point because this is a really bad time to launch. And I'll just push it to like February or March next year. Yeah. So, so who is your customer? I know it, the customer avatar is you, but you designed this bag in mind. Who mm-hmm. who do you see as your I other than you? Who is your ideal customer for this product? Yeah, I just basically looked at a lot of travel influencers, and um, so maybe you could argue this is maybe going a bit too deep. But I basically looked at who are the travel influencers that I align with the most. That I really like the places that are going, the content that they're producing. And I'm like, well, who are the people I actually look up to this person? So I basically go on their page, I look at their photos and their videos that they post, and I read all their comments. And then I go on the profiles of the people who write the comments because they're the people who align. And then I basically look at them and be like, okay, they live in California, they're 25 years old. Based on their pictures, this is the type of income that they have. And I basically draw in my mind, my customer avatar, based on the people who engage with the influencers who align the most with my brand, if you know yeah. what I mean. Makes sense. Um, uh, just quickly say some hellos. Uh, Jason's back, Veronica's here, Matthew. Um, who else have we got? Stahel, hope you well. Gerard's here. Kaylee's here as well. Andrew, got a question. It says, how to deal with everyone copying your innovations, not only sellers, but suppliers too? Um, take it as a compliment. <laughs> because... <laughs> You know, the thing is, um, you can you can like protect, I think you're going to go into more detail on this in tomorrow's show in terms, yeah. in terms of yeah. like how to protect your ideas and whatnot. But, you know, a lot of people ask me like, you know, should I get my supplier to sign an NDA, NNN, all that sort of stuff. And th- there's two ways you can look at it, right? Personally, I don't, I've never got a supplier to sign an NDA or NNN because I always operate on full trust. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you get them to sign something like that, you're kind of sending the message that I don't trust you. And then that's basically not building your business relationship on the right foundation. But people who just do one product and they smash it for six months to get all the sales they can and they pivot and they get into another product, well, they were never going to build much great relationships with their manufacturers anyway. So you might as well go down the route of protecting yourself legally. But whenever I like to work with a manufacturer, I sort of always think of the long game and I intend to work with them for more than 10 years. So I don't basically like to operate that way. But if you feel like you've just got an idea, you want to run with it quickly and you don't want anyone else jumping on it, mm-hmm. you can get them to sign an NDA and an NNN, but then also protect yourself in your domestic country as well through your patents and stuff that well you've only got to look at somewhere like apple and nike have probably got the best legal team in the world that they still get copied in china so what hope do we have <laughs> in some case yeah yeah and, yeah and you know what the, the other thing as well is that like you have to be constantly innovating because mm. what i like to do is like once i develop a product i don't just sit on it and, and watch the sales come in like as soon as it's developed i'm developing the next iteration for the next season like we mm. always like traditionally we always develop products for seasons like spring summer 2020 spring summer 2021 And it's like, as soon as that product comes to market, I'm now taking that feedback on to go and develop the next one because I always want to be ahead. So if someone has copied your product, by the time they bring that to market, you've already brought out the next one. Mm -hmm. And also if suppliers do copy your product and offer it to other people, then that's also a clear indication that you're not gonna work with them again and they've then lost your business. So if your business is of a decent enough level, they're not gonna play that game anyway because they don't wanna lose you as a customer. But I'll give you an example. Like I was in a, I was in a factory. I was developing an outdoor bag, and um, I would basically developed about five different bags, and I only ordered like three of them because that's th- enough that I wanted for that category for that season. Uh, and then I came back to that factory the following year to develop more products, and then I saw the sample that I had developed in another brand's logo and colors, and it was on their wall in their showroom. I was like, I developed that bag, and they were like, Oh yeah, but you didn't order it, so we just like showed it to someone else. And I was like, Yeah, but I was 
it's my design. Um, and then so I basically stopped working for that supplier and then like the competitor was in her catalog and the sales were good. And I was like, you know what I mean? But then I just, I purely just took it as a compliment that I can design great products that other people want. So mm-hmm. it, I, it didn't phase me, it didn't bother me. How long have you been designing products? Obviously I know how long you've been sourcing, but when did you get the bug for the development stage? Same, uh, 10 years, because uh, I've always just started with designing things and improving things and making it better. And, you know, we kind of talked about it on the, the podcast with Kevin and um, mm-hmm. and Steve, as I go by a concept as well called imitate and innovate. You mm-hmm. never quite want to like, you, didn't, you never want to copy anyone's product, but sometimes you see something and you're like, that works. That's awesome. But then you have to innovate on top of that. Kind of like, as I mentioned in like the third point, is it what is your USP? What's your unique selling proposition over the leader? How is this going to be better? So what you can do is you can see something and be like, all right, well, that's a good product, but it doesn't have any waterproof rain cover coating or like it doesn't have a compartment for your mobile phone. So I'll add that, you know, you can still innovate on top of something that already works. Cool. This is the big question from Dan. So we can see that... um... We'll have to climb over the top of it. Do you tend to have a backup manufacturer in case something might go wrong with one of your factories or on a particular product? Do you tend to get the samples or small orders from your plan B supplier or just deal with the situation if and when it comes up? That's a great question. And yes, I do have backups. So what I normally do is before like placing an order to a factory and once I've got my sample ready, and well and the specification sheet i send it a specification sheet out to maybe three or four different suppliers first so i get the mm. pricing back so i really understand what is the market price for it then like if the pricing is workable for me then i'll ask for samples from all three or all four different suppliers and i'll basically compare their quality against the price that they've given and then i'll basically um work with the one that is the best quality for the best price but mm. then i've already now received samples and the price from the backup for the exact same product so I'll I'll tell the supplier, hey, uh, thanks very much for your sample and your price. Uh, you didn't actually win the order on this occasion, but I am going to consider you for future orders. So thanks very much. And then if anything happens with your existing manufacturer, like maybe they get too busy or or something goes wrong, then you can immediately go to the other two that you got quotes from and say, hey, you know that sample that you made? Let's go mm-hmm. into production. And you've already agreed the price and you've agreed the sample. So. Mm-hmm it's very important to have those backups because quite often that development process can take 30, 60 days and you don't yeah. want to have that time lag when you're desperate for stock. Yeah, and, and obviously big, big brands, they have factories all around the world, don't they, that have the same yeah. manufacturing process all being put into place but different locations to deal with demand on, in, in those territories as well, don't they? Yeah. Cool. Um, has anyone got any more questions for Kian or is there anything you want to add at the moment, mate? No, that's pretty good. I, I mean, actually, um, one sort of question that I kind of wanted to open up to, mm. to anyone listening live is that, like, I've been asked quite a few times recently, well, what sort of products should we be developing today in this current good. situation? Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of people, you know, maybe like travel, but travel is really down at the moment and we don't know when it will get back up. But then maybe people want to get into, like, you know, uh, homeschooling and home care and coloring in books and whatnot. But then is that going to be very competitive? And it's like, the data that we have over the last 30 days is not accurate because the times that we're in now we've never been in before and it's like i don't i don't know the answer to that like what um I, well anything that i do i like to have a long-term vision so i say okay if we're going through a little blip right now well my aim is not to make profit in six months it's to have something sustainable that's going to last for the next like you know 10 years so mm-hmm. kind of like regardless of the times i'm still going to develop whatever i wanted to develop but these times are so crazy. We've never seen anything like it before. And we don't know if this is going to last for a year uh, or six months or nine months. So it is, you know, I, I, I don't know the solution. So if anyone else has got any ideas into what type of products should we develop today, I'd love, so uh, love to, to hear cr- your opinion. To crystallize, is like, do you run off in one direction and just go all essentials because in case we had this? Or do you just stick to your guns and just go, okay, well, everyone's jumping over here. If I stay where I am. And uh, that's, that is part of my risk strategy or my risk portfolio, yeah? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's a question here. Do you – here we go. Fernando's back again. Do you work with a lot of uh, – do you work a lot in your buyer persona other than checking influencers? How much time do you invest in this? Yeah, well, aside from checking out influencers, like – as I said before, like I'm a product practitioner of what I want myself. So kind of like I know what I want myself first, then I test it on myself first, and then I reach out to other people as well to see if they're also on board with it as well. But sometimes like 
if you stand, if you believe so strongly in something, you just have to go for it anyway, regardless of what other people say to you. If you truly believe in it, then you just have to roll the dice and, and go for it as well. Yeah. Uh, Yelchin, we um, on the podcast, if you go to sellersessions.com, we've done a stack of content with Kian talking about product development. And I also done, I think, 15 episodes with different entrepreneurs talking through their process of product development as well. So there's them resources. But Kian, as a practitioner, where do you go for inspiration? Where do you read up to improve yourself on product development where these guys can take a look? Um, it's hard to answer because I just kind of spend a lot of time in the factories and, mm. um, you know, as I sort of gave the example of being on the production line in the backpack factory, well, I've done that in over 500 different factories. So my mind is kind of like, I see how everything's made and I can sort of make different calculations in my head of how I want them to be improved. But if you've never been to a factory, it's hard to basically expose yourself to that. So I don't know. I mean, I, I guess, um, <laughs> maybe just go to some factories uh, go to china and spend as much time as at the canton fair as possible um because i feel like this is something that you really learn in person this is not the sort of thing you can read from a book you know uh, mm -hmm. it just comes it just comes from experience but also uh, using and testing all the different products yourself as well and also like any product that you have in your home or any product that you buy yourself also consider just deconstructing them and figuring out how they're actually made as well because once you actually pull something apart and you realize actually what goes into it, then that might open your mind up a little bit as well. Yeah. No worries. Uh, Dan says, great. Thank you for answering that. Makes sense from the previous question. And Yalchin here, thanks. I'm watching your daily. It is great. Thanks. Um, okay. So top down, if we're going to go through quickly, round up your bullet points, not in graphic detail. You had the 12 points. Sure. Give okay, cool. Yeah. So the first one, self-actualizing, creating the product that you want. Yeah. Two, start with passion. Is it something you use yourself? Three, um, do you have something unique? What is your unique selling proposition over the leader? Four, uh, create a mood board or a vision board, as I've now heard it called. Um, and then buy competitor samples. Six, go into the retail stores as well. Mm -hmm. uh, seven, check the search volume traffic and keywords for your ideas. Um, eight, write every feature that you want for that product and then solve for those features. Uh, nine, complete the product specification sheet or the tech pack, the bill of materials. Ten, don't overdevelop. Eleven, test, 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 and that's test it using yourself, a third-party QC company, and then an influencer. Um, and then twelve, align with the right manufacturer which fits your purpose. Um, Thirteen, your marketing starts with your product development. And 14, make one item yourself. Sounds good. Uh, I just want to go over the shows for the rest of the week. So Tuesday 14th, tomorrow is patents and legal solutions around your product. Wednesday the 15th is Roundup Wednesday, uh, what's happening on Amazon this week. Thursday is the Shopify special and offset offs Amazon at scale. We'll do multiples of those. Friday, Kevin King's going to come in and talk about leveraging your cash flow and getting it go further and just different financial instruments out there and from his experience uh, as well. Saturday is Women of Amazon Part 5. And then Sunday, we do Mindset Sunday. And this week, we'll focus on mental health. Now, I'm sure we're going to get you back, Kian, for some other subjects over the next week or so. Uh, the best way to reach you is to go to your group do you want to give uh, a shout out to your group here? Sure, yes. Uh, thanks. So the group is on Facebook. That's called Sourcing with Kian. And uh, also very, very active on Instagram at the moment, which is Kian underscore JG. And uh, let's say J for, uh, actually, I'm not good at these. Uh, J was, for Jamie? <laughs> yeah, J, J for Jamie, G for Golzari. Uh, okay. And we actually did a Facebook Live on Friday. I had three really... Um, cool people and have I've you got, got a re I, replay on your play uh, on your page for that yeah no no i messed it up because it was the first time i did an ig live so i didn't figure out how to save it but i've got another one coming up this friday and this friday i've got four really awesome people one who's going to go really detailed into tiktok one mm -hmm. who went viral on youtube one who's really big into personal brand and the fourth uh someone which is very big on facebook so i basically got four different social media platforms each one's going to explain for 15 minutes how to get to the top of that and i'm going to interview them on instagram so definitely check that out on friday and connect with me on instagram kian underscore jg sounds good uh Selva says thank you danny and kian jason again great episode we'll be reviewing this once again robert connor awesome gold as always thanks kian and danny 
Uh, Dan, really appreciate all your work and sharing, guys. Joined your group, Kian, too. Fernando, thanks for the content. Andrew says, very helpful. Thank you very much. Selva says, thank you, Danny and Kian. Guys, we're out. See you again same time tomorrow, 4 p.m. UK and whatever time that is around the rest of the world. Tiffany, see you later. Kian, again, thank you. Everyone be safe. Lots of love. See you tomorrow, 4 p.m. Take care. Thanks, guys.